I would like you to join me in welcoming Liz to the stage. Liz. Thanks, Bria. Oh, thank you. Wow. Uh, when Maureen King um, said to me, would you like to do inviting me to do the oration? I went, oh, yeah, OK. And then I realised what it was. And wow. It's so nice to see some friendly faces, because I need them today. I'm a bit nervous. So um, the topic that uh, I've chosen is uh, a sustainable agricultural journey. And uh, I hope it's going to keep us uh, involved for a little while. So, um, so Bruce Levy, uh, the, uh, he was a great hero of mine, and uh, came to New Zealand in '82. and his book, Grasslands of New Zealand, uh, was just, you just had to read it, and that's been great. So what I wanted to do today with you was take you through a timeline from 1982 when I arrived here in New Zealand up to sort of today. So the slides are going to take us through sort of events, some policies, some activities um, that I feel for me, um, so it's all about me today, guys, sorry, um, well, how I feel um, were important in, in my thinking and I think in what's been going on in the, in the science field. Uh, then, oh gosh, yesterday, wasn't that a fabulous session, that first session? And I can't believe it, but the work of Melissa and Tom we hadn't spoken, and I'm going to have similar slides, which is really interesting, because we're going to talk a bit about those global trends. <coughs> then that whole passion, that's why we're here. Grasslands, they're fabulous, absolutely fabulous. I want to talk a little bit about them, and then I'm going to ask you to indulge me a little bit, and I've got a few insights which I'd like to share with you. So if you're all geared up, let's take this journey together. So... Tom talked about the Green Revolution. That's probably why I'm standing here. I did an ecology degree in 1972, and it was the second year of an ecology. It was a new science, fabulous new science. And I was really inspired by the Green Revolution. I was inspired because it was increasing food production for a world, and it really drove me to applied science. And that's fabulous, except in hindsight now, we see what the unintended consequences of the Green Revolution were. The levels of nitrogen fertilizers that had to go on, the water that was used, and the unintended environmental consequences of the cumulative effect. It was fabulous. We, we did, and we are continuing to feed large people, large populations in the world. And we now have to deal with the fact about how do we deal with those unintended cumulative effects. And cumulative effects is something I want to keep sort of referring to as we go through the timeline. So the, uh, the next thing really I want to talk about is the, the global con conversations around sustainable development and sustainable agriculture. So in 1987, it was the Brundtland Report came up, and this is what we used as the definition for a long time around sustainability. Then globally, we had the Earth Summit in, uh, I can't remember the date, 92, and that was uh, at Rio, and that was really where the world's uh, countries got together to talk about, they started to conclude the environment in their discussions around sustainability. And then in 2000, we had the Millennium Development Goals. There were eight goals. Um, unfortunately, what was happening there was it was a very sort of uneven uh, around the globe. A lot of uh, the donors were trying to help get rid of some of the debt uh, that the developing countries had, and there wasn't so much on the development itself. And then we come 15 years later, and now we're sitting here with the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 of them, all interlinked, and all now with people sitting in the middle of it. So we can see that globally, that journey over the last 37 years in the sustainable development area is influencing what we were doing here in New Zealand. Now, this is the slide. I laughed yesterday because <laughs> Tom had this. And so what I really think is important is that when we talk about grasslands, we're talking about social ecological systems. Grasslands on their own need, in New Zealand, they need human intervention. 
and they deliver a lot of great things to people. And within those social ecological systems, there were some shocks that came into that system that I want to kind of explore. And that first shock for me was in 1984. I, le I always joke, people say to me, why did you come to New Zealand? And I said, well, I was an economic refugee from Margaret Thatcher, which was true. There were no jobs. And two years later, we get the market economy hitting New Zealand. That was a financial shock. And that has reverberated, as Tom said, right through to today. It had immediate social impacts. Um, it had immediate uh, environmental impacts. So if you remember, again, the government of the previous government, the 84, had given a lot of land development grants. And that meant that the, a lot of the steeper country was cleared and we got some good pasture and good sheep and beef systems in those areas. As soon as 84 came and those subsidies were dropped, then those areas really reverted. So that was an unintended consequence of a financial shock coming into the country. Um, so then we have the Brundtland Report in 87. The other shocks that we know about was 1988 and Bola. And I remember getting in a car with Carl Ragish, Peter Rattray, Gavin Sheath, a whole heap of us in the car over to Gisborne to see what we could do about renovating those areas where the slip had occurred on the flat. How were we going to re reseed that? A climatic, uh, which, had, um, which then made us start thinking about resilience, resilience of our communities to withstand these types of events, and also the resilience of the land itself, and then thinking about what is the most suitable land use um, for those areas. And then we come into what I call an institutional shock. <laughs> so we're still reverberating from that. So here we are, 30 years on. In 1991, the Crown Research Institutes were pulled together. So no more MAF, no more DSIR, all together. Um, and that was also an introduction of the contestable funding system, because it was deemed that the more competition we've got, the better ideas we have. Um, and, uh, and also, the, and as that's matured through the 30 years, I would really ask, is it a fit-for-purpose uh, institution now? Because we heard yesterday from Garth about the mosaics of land use that are required and the interdependencies of the sectors these days. You know, do we have a fit-for-purpose um, research uh, institution? And at the same time, in 91, we had the Resource Management Act, very world leading at the time. And again, that whole emphasis on the fact that our resources are finite and that we need to be managing those collectively. So then we come on and we've got the Earth Summit in 92. Um, and here we come in and I was really happy. Terry, where are you? Terry Palminter. Do you remember in 94? There you go. We, uh, we met with fed farmers. And um, Jim Cotman, I don't think Jim's here. And Jim was a, don't believe in this environment stuff. And that was why he came into the programme of work. Farmers in New Zealand were struggling in 94 to try to define what was the definition for sustainable agriculture? What were the indicators we were going to use? How were we going to monitor them? What did it mean? And so in 1995, uh, we set up um, some study groups out of Fara Fara Research Centre. And those study groups were with uh, beef, sheep and beef farms and with dairy farms. And another thing Melissa said yesterday really stuck with me. I went to uh, one of our uh, partner <laughs> sector uh, research institutes and consultancies and said, could you put someone in? You know, we need someone for this, this study group. Liz, environment is just a fad. That's what I was told in 1995. It's a fad. So when we hear Melissa and we hear veganism and it's just a fad, we really need to prick our ears up a little bit. Um, anyway, the, the whole thing around the study groups was that we were linking productivity and environment together. And it was, we had policy people there, we had sector people there, and we had farmers. And we were trying this all out together. 
And the really interesting thing from that perspective was that farmers were really, really keen to, to demonstrate leadership, to demonstrate voluntarily best practices. We put a lot of those together out of these study groups. The Farm Environment Awards out of the Waikato arose out of the conversations that were had with those study groups. And they became the Balanced Farm Environment Awards. So we've been, farmers have been thinking about this and looking and trying to demonstrate their actions for a long time. Then in 1997, we got the Kyoto Protocol, and that was our first in New Zealand, the whole thing around with the first fart tax, the ETS. And again, here we are today, another how many years later, talking about the same thing. Then we have 2,000 with the Memennial Goals. Really nice to see Bruce Thor all the way up the back there. Remember this slide? Special protection for Lake Topo. It was the first time that we had land, land use policy that was driven by the, the water quality in Lake Topo. And what we had here was uh, a regional council that had been interested in doing monitoring. And the lake visibility is still fabulous, 15 metres. But the trends were showing deterioration. And also, we knew that there was some phytoplankton, so the clarity was, was getting a bit murky. The big concern was what was coming up the track. Because the catchment itself was a predominantly sheep and beef catchment. But the council were really concerned that there was dairy expansion happening. And they were worried that without a regulation, you would get dairying uh, coming into the catchment and there would be more nutrients lost. It was a really interesting time. Farmers were terrified. I know that Bruce and Greg Lambert, you'd go to those meetings in the evening, and they just, the anger, the denial. I mean, how, how come I'm doing work on my farm here, and how come it's, 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 it's having an impact over there? You know, why is this? The inequality, Māori, Tuwharitoa, low emissions, of, of, uh, and they were stuck with that for the future. A really landmark piece of work. And I think the important thing about this was we did some fabulous, and we still do, some fabulous farm systems work. So Gavin Sheath, you're here. I saw you. Um, great work. Most of us today are still working at the farm scale. What we didn't take into consideration as scientists is actually the cumulative impact. One plus one is not two. That aggregation. So in our thinking as we move forward, we've been having to really think about the scale of our science, the scale of our research, the scale of the impact. And that's been really important. Then we come to 2004 and the growing for good. Morgan Williams, the canary in the mine, that report that came through when he talked about dialogue, redesign, he, might, he didn't use the word transformation because that's today's buzzword, but it was redesign, it was systems design. It was showing the trends uh, of, of what was happening um, and the uh, giving real warnings about, again, our monitoring and our progress and the behaviour change that was going to be required. So what was driving the community? Because people say, oh, the market will decide. It was nothing to do, Topo was nothing to do with the market. Dirty dairying campaigns are nothing to do with the market. They're all to do with local communities. And local communities want to swim, they want to collect kai, then they were seeing deterioration. And at the same time, we were looking at, you know, we need the dairy sector, we need the sheep and beef sector as a country. And we were seeing the expansion and the extension. And what Morgan's report was doing was waving a little flag and saying, beware, there's going to be cumulative impacts of this. And we can see that with the figures here, where we had 
you know, um, the North Island, this is 94 to 2004, you know, 78% of uh, increases over that time. That's what Morgan was waving the flag about. And then, at the same time, you can see these pressures building up, can't you? At the same time, globally, this is what the market was looking for at that time. It was food miles. And, you know, these amazing adverts where they were pouring oil over the top of ad apples and saying, this is the true cost of your product for New Zealand. Carolyn Saunders did a fabulous job in going to Britain and helping uh, New Zealand tell the real story about food miles. And Stuart Leggard's done some fabulous work in that whole life cycle assessment around food miles. And I'll take you to this bit here. Have a bit of a read of that. New Zealand is good. It's efficient. Your grassland systems are efficient. That means per kilogram of product, you're remo you, know, you, you have less, we have less uh, carbon than other countries. And that's due in a lot to our grass-based systems. Now, Ministry for Foreign Affairs and Trade asked Stuart and us to do some analysis for them last year, which I presented at the COP25 climate change. They had development projects around the world in dairy and sheep, um, sheep and, well, not sheep, but cattle. The one, and the, these development projects had all been put in place to increase productivity. What they wanted was a retrospective to say, well, what did that mean for greenhouse gases? The key thing, the key change that had been happening on all of those farms was the increase in homegrown feed. As soon as you stop importing, concentrates your greenhouse gas emissions per product go down. We have got the most amazing grassland system. Grass-fed beef, the first light, will have one of the lowest footprints per product. The problem you get is that the efficiency gains when you gain them on an animal, cumulative impact again, increase the number of animals and you've lost your gain on the total uh, emissions. So again, we have to think, we've got that, but you know, what, it, what does that mean for the numbers that we're gonna carry? But the message there is grassland and homegrown feed is the, one of the best ways of reducing greenhouse gases per unit of product. Then in 2010, globally, we had this book come out from the, F uh, the Food Agriculture Organization, Livestock's Long Shadow. Wow, has it been a long shadow? It's really come right up to today. You can see the rise in the vilification of red meat from that book. The whole, it, it just put all out there, all the negative impacts on the environment. It took no account of any positive contribution that livestock makes to the world. The unintended consequence of that was that donors started disinvesting all over the world in uh, livestock farming. And we um, have had the uh, whole rise in the social media of, again, that vilification of livestock without taking into consideration the benefits. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So then 2014, we had the National Policy Statement for Fresh Water. I think we got a new one this, this month, didn't we? Everybody's putting submissions in. And 2015, I was very, very privileged to be on the technical uh, leaders group for the Waikato um, Healthy Rivers Plan Change. I just want to make a couple of comments about, about that. One is that the uh, looking at the future the co-governance in the Waikato was fabulous. The fact that Māori and the Crown were coming together to give a vision for uh, the Waikato River was very strong. Then we come back to, the, again, the collaborative process. I mean, the, uh, the NPS of the, uh, was really about, let's get the, back into the regions, let's get communities to decide the values you want, let's look at this collaborative process. One of the key things for me was, over two and a half years, educating a group of people in the most complex of areas. And then the second point is, 
How do they make those decisions given the massive amount of data? And I say massive amount of data because there was a lot of data on the environmental impact. We got quite a bit of data on the economics. But when it came to, well, what would that transition path look like to this glorious vision? You need integrated assessment. You need the ability to look at what those land use changes are going to mean for the environment, for those values that are important, for the communities, for the, the schools, for the labour. All of these things need to be taken into consideration if you're thinking about a transition plan, because that will really govern the length of time that you can take to take your, to take your um, plan to transition. We have a dearth of social data. It's inadequate for the decisions that we have to take over time. And we need, and we, we, we need to be working on how we're going to get that. Um, and so the collaborative process is not going to be that successful if we can't look holistically at the whole system and what, it, uh, what these plan changes mean. That doesn't mean we delay but it does mean that we have to be aware that there are certain gaps. So then we have the sustainable development goals we talked about. The 2016 Paris Agreement. The very interesting thing that we don't hear about that is that underpinning that agreement is food security. So we hear a lot about carbon and carbon emissions and lowering greenhouse gases, and that's very, very important. But underlying it is about, underlying it is about food security. And agriculture only came in in the last, uh, from I think it was in, the, in what they call the Coronivia um, uh, initiative, which is actually looking at agriculture as a whole, and then what that means from retaining food security um, as well as managing emissions. So I think that's really something we have to remember that again, from a grassland perspective, we still need to produce food because we have to feed people. And so again, those are the trade-offs we've got to be looking at. So that's a backward glance. And I hope the key messages for that are that the social ecological systems, there's a lot of unintended consequences of everything we do and we need to look at things within an integration. So looking forward into some of the global trends, Melissa talked about these yesterday. It was great. Um, and we've got, so what we know, you know is that we've got you know, a hungrier world. That's, you know, the predictions are up to 10 billion by 2050. That's another 2 billion on the planet. Some of those people are going to be much wealthier. And uh, that's mainly in the Asia, Indonesia part of the world. And uh, what we do know is as people get wealthier, um, they want to eat more animal protein. Then we've got the bumpier ride. Well, I don't need to tell you about Brexit, Trump. Um, another bumpier ride is financial. So I was reading in the stuff this morning about, you know, the debts and the banking and the financial institutes at the moment in New Zealand and really reining in the lending to the rural sector at the time when the government is asking for some quite major changes to perhaps occur on farm, so where's that money going to come from? So again, um, thinking about those bumpier rides, climate change obviously right in the middle there. Um, and then we've got things like antimicrobial resistance. We don't hear a lot about that. Biosecurity is really important to New Zealand. Uh, five minutes, great. Then we've got our transformational technologies. And we've got our choosier customers and the transformational technologies are all the drones, all etc. We heard yesterday from Melissa, you know, about and the first light, what does your customer want? So we know there's a lot of ethics that they're looking for, personalized food, functional food. We know there's a decrease in milk being produced, cow's milk in the States, and the rise of the plant-based milks. We've got the vegan rise. Only 3%, as Melissa said yesterday, but it's in the media, it's out there, it's in the front. The Long Shadows book comes in, the whole environmental impact, it's all sitting there. And we have to understand that there will be a portfolio of food systems. 
And part of those will be, there will be non-animal food systems. That, that's there, it will be part of the portfolio. So it comes back to the messages yesterday about New Zealand and its grassland-based systems. And you know, securing a strong part of that global portfolio of food systems. It's not going to be an either or. So we have to make a decision about where in that portfolio are we going to get our best returns while still delivering to what the local communities want in New Zealand. We heard about these next generational shoppers um, yesterday, the Janes and the Johns of the world. So what? It's complex, I like this slide. Science versus everything else. Simple solutions, quick answers, but they're the wrong. And we're looking at complexity. And I really worry that three-year funding ain't gonna help you solve complexity. And um, there's a real concern about um, just where our institutions are not aligned to the challenges that we need for the future. And we need to look at those institutions and get them better aligned. I love this. I tell a lot of young people, we have to have be open to all questions, to be open to all the questions. We've got to start thinking differently. It's not about what you think, it's how you think. It's about how you're viewing the world and how you're influenced. And change is not just that. Farmers got to change their practice. Change is that they, you know, the institutions. Beef and lamb have got to change their practice. Dear New Zealand's got to praise it. The universities have got to change. Financial institutions have to change. Technology will change. We need change, and it's called innovation. But change requires a systemic approach. And we've talked a lot um, in the past about tech transfer and the new buzzword, co-innovation, get everybody in a room and we'll all co-design. Systems thinking coming in, design thinking's the buzz thing, transformation. Actually, it's blooming hard. If you've got a simple issue, you can do some simple things. If you've got complexity, you go across to that co-innovation part of the graph here. Um, but again, we need a package. It's not one or all. We also need to build system uh, innovation to give confidence for people to make change. And this, again, is the idea that you might have a cluster, a grouping of farmers. You really need a strong facilitator who's going to help them guide their thinking, guide their questioning, not tell them what to do, but they really need to be you know, supported by subject matter specialists, and the capability development at the community level is really, really important. So again, we need to take a systems approach to building confidence for change. How do we scale it up? Globally, nobody knows. It's really hard to scale up. One of the things that we believe are in the whole idea of the social networks, and those circles here are your, your people with most influence. They're the people that everybody talks to, and you know who they are. They're in the audience. The flow of information between those, getting that information there, getting the networks in place, knowing where they are, strengthening them is really, really important because it's not just the farmer who makes the change. Grassland systems, we, we talked yesterday, you don't grow grass. You don't grow animals. You provide food and nutrition security. You provide livelihoods and economic growth. You provide animal health and welfare, and there are some really great opportunities for you to help with the climate action. Stop talking about growing grass. Nobody's interested that you grow grass. Nobody's interested that if I use a hammer or I, I've got a particular four by four plywood, I want the house. So start talking to people about in the pub, not that you grow grass, but that you're providing food and nutrition and security to people. Look at grasslands through four lenses, the social, the local development, the environmental, and the production, because you're giving multiple functions from your grasslands. And they're providing and contributing to nine of the sustainable development goals. So I'm saying grasslands of the world unite. That picture in the middle is in Brazil two weeks ago. A guy went to Massey, came back to the Rio Grande do Sol, and set up an extension unit based on New Zealand. Uruguay, McMeekin went. The world knows that we have the best grassland systems. We've got to get that message out. And lastly, have I got a minute? Okay. 
We've been attempting to address these issues for 37 years. It's a long time. Don't tell me this is just happening. This has been on the go a while, and we have done very little evaluation. What's worked? What hasn't worked? What's happening? We don't know. We've got excellent and relevant science. We don't have enough funding, of course, and it's too short, but hey, that's just the pitch. Uh, the important thing there is that the science only informs the decisions, and sometimes it's not value-free. We would like to think it is, but it's not. Social science. Why do I not come to grasslands very often? Because you don't embrace it. You think it's swoofy, swoofy stuff. We need social science to understand decision making. We need to have it embedded in along with the technical. We need to increase our capability and systems and assessment. And what we know is that with the multiple goals that we get from grasslands, there will be trade-offs, there will be prioritization, but we need to design those transition paths and we need to do that together. And to do that, we have to actually respect other knowledge, other knowledge <coughs> systems and diversity. And for me, it's been all about passion, energy, tenacity. I added that last word, urgency. Because when I looked at that timeline, I went, what? You know, we've made good progress, but not enough. And I just really would like to thank um, colleagues, the Fara Fara team. Oh, I'm going to cry. You guys are just cool. And everybody else who's really worked with me through the years. We've made a difference. We have. Thank you.